I would like to acknowledge that we are able to meet here today on these ancestral, traditional, and unceded lands because of the generosity and kindness of the Muscoom people. I'm personally joining you today from unceded and uh, traditional territories of the Squamish, Coast Salish, and Solitude people. I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, you are joining us from many places uh, and uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. You may visit uh, native-land if you haven't done so already to learn more. Um, so I will just quickly pass to Terry and Tara to quickly introduce themselves. Um, Tara, do you want to go ahead? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tara Moreau, and I am uh, have the privilege of working at the UBC Botanical Garden. Uh, excited to talk to you about the programming we have on underway. Uh, over to you, Terry. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm Terry Sunderland. I'm professor of tropical forestry at the in the Faculty of Forestry. Um, I've been at UBC about four and a half years, and pre previously to that, I was working exclusively in the tropics on tropical forestry issues. Um, and I um, teach on a course, uh, Conservation 452, which is a capstone course, which utilizes the SDGs as a sort of framework for implementation. So happy to be here today and look forward to the discussions. Great. Um, if you guys don't mind, if, if you can just quickly introduce yourself in the chat, uh, maybe your name, uh, the lands you are joining us from, and um, uh, if you're teaching, uh, what you're teaching, uh, that would be great. And I'll share the agenda. So this is our quick agenda here. Uh, we will briefly talk about the Sustainable Development Goals. I'll give a brief overview, uh, followed by uh, Terry and Tara and myself sharing a bit of how we are taking uh, the approach, what kind of approach we are taking to integrate SDGs into our programming and courses. Um, and then we will do a bit of a group activity and Q&A. So sustainable development goals, um, although it has its own critique within the concept of development about how it promotes or not promotes sustainability, as a concept, we still use the 1987 definition proposed uh, by Brundtland um, as, a def as a development that meets the needs of present without compromising the ability of the future generations. Um, within that context, um, the decade of education for sustainability ended in 2015. Um, and now we are in a decade of action, uh, which, uh, which is basically a focus uh, for ESD then becomes uh, sustainable development goals, the 17, uh, 17 goals that we will talk about today. And here they are. Um, so the sustainable development goals are ambitious objectives for a greener, healthier, um, and peaceful and equal planet. The idea of the SDGs was born in 2012 at the Rio Plus 20 summit in Brazil. Um, and at the summit, government leaders began creating a set of universal goals to tackle poverty, ill health, inequality, and environmental degradation. Uh, the idea was to use the SDGs as a new agreement to replace the eight millennial development goals, or MDGs, which expired in 2015. Um, this these 17 goals are a result of the largest consultation in history. It took three years to design the goals and targets uh, with governments, businesses, communities, universities, and NGOs, including youth all over the world, participated in negotiations with more than 7 million people voting in 80, 84 national surveys. And finally, in September 2015, after many years of discussion and consultation, all 193 countries finally agreed and signed the SDGs framework and made the commitment to achieve them by 2030. Um, so I'll pause here and I'll say maybe if you can use your annotate function at the top of your screen um, and let us know a little bit about um, how do you link to the SDGs and if you're teaching which SDGs uh, do you think your courses connect to well. Um, so you can use your annotate at the top and use the stamp function if you can um, and just stamp the SDGs that you feel most connected to. So this is usually the case. We start with one and then we start thinking about it <laughs> and then we start linking it to others. And that's that's basically one of the key characteristics of SDGs that they're so interlinked. Um, thank you, that's, that's great. So I'm going to clear this and so we can move on.
So just quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the key aspects of, of this framework. Uh, one is that it is universal. The goals apply to every country, equally developed and developing countries, including Canada and US, both rich and poor countries, including cities and villages, um, all ages and all genders. It is indivisible. Uh, which means achievement of one goal is linked to the achievement of the others. It's like a puzzle, which cannot be completed without all the pieces. So for example, poverty, which is uh, goal one, can lead to hunger and malnutrition, which is goal two, which may lead to health problems. Goal three, that may prevent children from completing their education, goal four, and adults from getting the job, which is goal eight. Um, so if you think about even uh, what will happen if we achieve goal one, um, how would it impact other goals? Um, the third one is that it is transformative. Uh, there is a need to move past business as usual and seek transformational solutions, changing how we think about money, growth, and profit, a new understanding of prosperity. So it's really asking us to think about how we can change our mindsets and paradigm. And the fourth one is leaving no one behind. Success depends on the inclusion of the poorest and most vulnerable in our communities. Around the world today, we have over 1 billion people living in extreme poverty, which is less than $2 a day, and lack access to clean water, electricity, and basic health care. Around a million, uh, around 6 million children, actually, um, and youth are out of school, and approximately 6 million uh, children die each year before the age of five, which is, 15,000 deaths each year. And at the same time, we have 82% 80, of the wealth created going to the top 1%. Uh, and if you think about it, there are really only 42 individuals that have much of the wealth of half of the population on Earth, which is 3.7 billion poorest people. So um, there are a few ways to look at the framework, and you may have heard about this. There are five Ps, uh, the people, planet, prosperity, partnership, and peace. Uh, so this is how they kind of fit under the five Ps. Um, and you can also look at them uh, through the three pillars model, which is the social, economic, and environment. Um, so the 17 SDGs have 116 um, 169 targets and 232 indicators. Um, some of the targets are very well defined, so there are smart goals, like such as reducing poverty at least 50%, so it is measurable. Uh, but then there are others that are very vague, um, so that, that is one of the um, weaknesses of the framework. Um, this, this kind of captures really well um, the indicators under the uh, 17 goals. Um, the yellow uh, indicates that there is incomplete or outdated data, so there is, uh, we still don't know how to measure those. Uh, red is global warming is not, uh, sorry, global monitoring is currently not possible, so there is no data whatsoever. And green is where the data is available and we are able to actually measure progress. So I like this because it kind of really gives us a good idea of how, where we are at in terms of uh, monitoring progress. Um, so that we can get, get ahead. Of course, the framework doesn't come uh, without its weaknesses, uh, so it's not a perfect framework. Uh, there are a lot of critiques of it, um, and there here are some of them. Uh, so we need to be mindful about how we present and interact with the goals uh, within our own context. So we are adapted in, adaptive in ensuring uh, that these weaknesses are being discussed. Um, but as a framework, it also offers organizations and governments to agree on a common purpose, uh, to agree on a direction, um, essentially to focus on what really matters for the future. So if we want to work together on something, we need to understand what the problem is. And these goals really capture a good direction for a lot of governments um, and organizations. And it also empowers communities to put pressure on governments and businesses to act and hold them to account. Um, I just wanted to also mention quickly before I end here and pass it to Tara is uh, UNESCO uh, recently launched a roadmap to 2030 highlighting universities roles role to in, in um, achieving these goals um, and uh, a key some of the key aspects that they mentioned in there was uh, to educate for this century means that we need to educate our students to be able to negotiate complexity. 
which is one of the most difficult and main missions of the higher education higher education today. Uh, a need for a holistic approach and a humanistic approach that requires moving beyond interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary approach from a social and ethical lens. Uh, and this may entail transforming higher education into lifelong learning inst institutions, something UNESCO has been pushing for since the launch of the 2030 agenda. So with that, um, we'll take a quick pause here um, and we will ask you if you could add an 18th um, SDG, what would that be? What's missing from this framework? I mean, there's lots missing, um, but we uh, just just a quick fact here. I believe um, they started with over 300 goals and then they narrowed it down to about 17. So that took a lot of time as well. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear from you. What do you think is missing? If you could add just one. Climate justice. Yes, that is definitely a big, big missing piece. Yeah, we definitely need education reform. I agree with that completely. Sustainable use of outer space. Yes. Nobody talks about that. <laughs> That's a big uh, blind spot for us, I think. Um, as you're thinking about that, uh, maybe I'll uh, pass it to Tara. Thanks. And I know for some people who maybe the SDGs are new, trying to think of their gaps is a, is a, a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, and I think that's an interesting, I know we were talking in prepping for this session about what was missing. And so thank you for sharing some of those ideas. I wanted to share a bit of the approach we've been taking. I've been taking here at the UBC Botanical Garden, really trying to align the work that I'm doing here and the work of botanical gardens around the work uh, around the world to the global goals. So uh, our garden grows here on the Musqueam territory and this is an incredibly important part of the work that we have been doing uh, exploring relationships between plants and people and the history of the collections that we steward as well as working with botanical gardens around the world to consider how uh, the history of botanical gardens was involved in uh, the displacement of indigenous people and knowledge and what we can be doing to to improve it and that's a big part of our work uh, next slide please we, we also manage the Nitobe Memorial Garden, which hopefully many of you have come to visit uh, as staff. Uh, you get in free to the, to the gardens and the attractions on campus, so I hope you can come and enjoy these spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So here at the Botanical Garden, uh, we work towards the vision that plants are understood, valued, celebrated, and secure in a healthy, biodiverse world. Uh, and our mission is really trying to mobilize around conservation, education, research, display, and community outreach. So uh, the, the Living Plant Collection is the key piece that is foundational to our work. You can explore our, our plant collections, our ex situ plant collections on our website. You can come and visit them. Uh, we have a diversity of plants and, and a significant focus on the conservation of important plants. Uh, we lead the Global uh, Maple Acer Consortium and are involved in other larger conservation initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. In particular, uh, I manage our sustainability and community programs. And so this looks like a diversity of ways that we try to have people connect and engage with the botanical garden, uh, looking at things like citizen science and community outreach. Uh, and I'm gonna talk in particular about uh, one of the programs that has really helped galvanize uh, my work around the SDGs. But before I do that, I, I wanted to just share there, there was a really key paper I read during my postdoc about looking at global f food systems and how do we align food policy in particular from local up to international levels. And this really has informed a lot of my thinking about how we can align local gardens to the global goals and really how do we put into practice this concept of acting locally and thinking globally. Next slide, please. 
So much of my work here, uh, I've been at the Botanical Garden for eight years, has really been trying to create policy aligned educational programs using the collections as our foundation, but really wanting to link it across different geopolitical uh, scales. And so uh, I've been aligning to the SDGs. Uh, traditionally, I aligned to the UN years, UN Year of Pulses, UN Year of Indigenous Languages. Uh, and I wanted to highlight here um, in particular, the policy alignment that we currently have at UBC in relation to uh, the rights of Indigenous peoples. We have a UBC strategic plan, the UBC Indigenous strategic plan. Uh, we have a support at a national level with the 96 calls to action for truth and reconciliation, as well as aligning to UNDRIP. Next slide, please. So I'm excited to share, we just last week published a paper we've been working on here at the Botanical Garden for a while, probably about a year and a half. Uh, it was part of a special issue of a journal looking at the role of botanical gardens around the world and their contributions to the SDGs. And this was a really interesting process to review our programs and our initiatives and see where we are contributing to the SDGs and opportunities moving forward in the future. Uh, we ended up doing a bit of a, an inventory and finding that our top SDGs were life on land, goal 15, uh, goal 12, responsible consumption and production, uh, goal two, zero hunger, goal four, uh, quality education, and goal six, uh, quality water. Uh, next slide, please. The paper is an open access paper, so uh, feel free to go and review it if you'd like. Um, much of this work was galvanized by a program I run called the Sustainable Communities Field School. This is a donor supported program that has really focused on uh, engaging local businesses and coming out to the botanical garden and learning about local sustainability as well as the UN sustainable development goals and so through this program I could be working in adapting and developing educational activities to engage adults primarily but more uh, recently also youth and how can we unpack and have people connect to the SDGs and explore which topics and which goals might be relevant to their operations. Next slide, please. Uh, in 2019, uh, we did, and maybe I'll put the links to some of these resources in the chat afterwards. Uh, we did explore and I worked um, to create a toolkit for botanical garden educators. I keep talking about botanical gardens and there's a really strong global network of botanic gardens around the world, uh, over 3,700 gardens that work together through uh, international organizations and collaborations to protect plants and, and to work to advance the global strategy for plant conservation. And so we created an Esri Story Map Toolkit to support educators who work in botanical gardens to think about how they might be able to uh, connect their gardens to the SDGs. And so I'll share that link. We have a virtual tour of how we have taken specific SDGs and try to unpack them at particular places within the garden. Uh, next slide, please. This is a, a an outcome of this program. Uh, there's a, a connecting with Unleash. It's a global innovation lab for youth, trying to train youth around the world and engaging them in developing a process to identify uh, solutions and, and really interestingly trying to, before we jump to the solutions, getting really clear on what the issues were, that we're tackling are. And this work was uh, a gathering of um, about a thousand youth and 200 facilitators. And we spent a week at the Fairy Lake Botanic Garden in, in China and in Shenzhen and working in botanical gardens to develop and design these solutions for climate action was the goal that we were working working on and just wanting to highlight the importance and the innovation uh, that youth bring to this process. And I think this is particularly relevant for us here at UBC where we have such amazing access to such incredible students. Uh, next slide, that's great, Shamta. A big focus has been uh, using our food garden, so hopefully you can come and explore our food garden, but using this garden, which is a central node within our within our larger garden to unpack and explore um, goal two, which is zero hunger. And in particular, looking at the conserving the genetic diversity of food plants. Um, 
it really, this is one of my favorite pictures where we have volunteers and staff and students all working and learning together. And I would say one of the things I've found about trying to engage people with the SDGs is that it's a really great space to talk about ecosystems and these interconnectivity uh, topics that bring together issues around uh, food security, agricultural production, uh, social justice, and, and inequalities. Uh, next slide, please. And as I wrap up, I, I, I know that Shamta had mentioned some of the universal values that the SDGs are advancing, and I, I wanted to just speak to one of the ones that really resonates with me, which is leave no one behind, and, and the importance of how we think about programs that are designed to do this. Uh, we do work here at the Botanical Garden with an organization called Kids Safe BC who work directly with children who are facing barriers to um, uh, financial resources and and working within the, the structure of UBC to raise funding to support programs that directly serve organizations that are working with those in our community who are facing barriers to finances, barriers to programming. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for, especially as we, it seems like many people in the chat are educators as to how do we design programs specifically so that we're serving those in our community who may have traditionally been left out of our programming. Uh, and with that, I will say next slide. I think I say thank you, and I'll pass it over. I think next is Terry. Thank you, Tara. Uh, so I'm going to give a little uh, bit of a different perspective uh, related to forestry and how it relates to the Sustainable Development Goals. So I, I was involved in the development of a strategy for um, an organization called the Center for International Forestry Research that redid its strategy in 2015, a 10-year strategy. Uh, which focused it almost exclusively on the Sustainable Development Goals. And there was a lot of um, discord at the time we were developing that strategy with some traditional foresters saying, that, you know, how do all these goals relate to forestry? And it actually is surprising how many of these goals relate to not only just forestry, but also forests in, in more broader, complex, multifunctional landscapes. And I'll touch on that uh, in a second. Next slide, please. So the, the purpose of, of sort of thinking about forestry for the 2030 agenda is, is thinking about how forests contribute to various SDGs. And, and they're very clear links between forests, poverty alleviation, food, nutrition and health, um, water, energy and housing. And you can see um, there's a lot of um, connections with various SDGs and linkages between the two, as, as Sheikh Shanta pointed out in the initial slide. Next slide, please. So I've been involved in a number of um, studies that look at the contributions of forests to the SDGs, as well as the implications of the SDGs for forests. So, for example, if we take SDG 2, one of the uh, reduce hunger, um, one of the, the, the main uh, targets there is to increase agricultural production. Well, agriculture is the, the largest driver of deforestation uh, throughout the world. Um, so, so we have trade-offs as well as synergies of those SDGs. So we need to think about how these play off against each other and how issues such as energy, food production, poverty alleviation relate in, in terms of forestry but also in terms of future sustainable development. Next slide please. So forests are important, um, we know that they're economically important, um, a huge number of people rely in forests in some way for their rural livelihoods, um, up to a quarter of the world's population. They are the reservoirs of large areas of, of large amounts of biodiversity. Um, and we know that um, currently forests are, are carbon sinks um, and the removal of forests contributes significantly to climate change um, through carbon emissions. Thank you. Um, forest trees and people overlap. And this is a really interesting study that was um, published a couple of years ago um, by colleagues in, uh, in uh, Colorado State University. Um, looking at the proximity of forests to people is actually surprising how close a lot of people live to, to, to forests. Um, and this is important not only for economic purposes, but also recreation, issues of ecosystem services, mental well-being, etc. Um, and so forests are incredibly important for both urban and rural societies. Next slide, please. So we also know that aside from direct economic benefits, the uh, ecosystem services in terms of food, clean water, energy, uh, are extremely important for particularly for the rural poor. Um, I've talked about the dependency on, on forests for basic human needs. 
Um, and these people are extremely susceptible to environmental changes. We, see, we saw last year in British Columbia some fairly extremes of weather, um, cold, wet, hot, etc. Um, those um, extremes are being mirrored elsewhere in the tropics as well. And where people don't have as much resilience to these, these changes, and, and we're seeing large amounts of displacement um, and people being deleteriously affected economically and environmentally through some of these environmental changes. Um, and we, oh, that's right. Um, so, if, no, it's okay, you go to the next slide. Um, so if we think about certain tropical landscapes, so, so we have a number of projects that work in a number of tropical landscapes um, in Africa uh, and Southeast Asia. And we sort of, many of these landscapes are dominated by trees and agriculture and the interaction between the two. And often you can, you can sort of conceive how individual SDGs are, are at play in these landscapes and how they interact. Um, and this is actually a really nice illustration uh, of exactly that. Um, life on land, the climate action, the poverty with economic development there, um, life below water, etc. Uh, and how these in interplay in these complex landscapes is extremely important. But forests and agriculture do tend to be the sort of main land uses of many of these, these rural landscapes. Next slide, please. Um, so we developed um, the SDGs um, as a teaching tool for our conservation capstone course um, about two or three years ago. Um, and we use individual SDGs as modules uh, on a weekly basis and relate them to other SDGs throughout the course. Um, and we published a, a, a very short piece in the Times uh, Educational Supplement uh, related to this a couple of years ago. Uh, next slide, please. So we basically do a lot of um, interactive uh, work getting students to think about the SDGs and why they're important. And it's interesting when we, when we open the course, we introduce the course to, this is a fourth year course um, to the students. They haven't really thought about the broader issues of sustainable development as, as it relates to forestry or conservation in the past. And so, you know, there's a sort of, so what question that comes up all the time. And it's that as the course unfolds, people, ah, oh, I get it now. Yeah, I see how that's related. And the issue of agricultural expansion leading to deforestation and how that relates. And forestry's changed very much from being a, a sort of productive system. You plant a tree, you watch it go, you grow, you cut it down, you plant another tree, you watch it grow, you cut it down. Forestry and society are much more complex. Um, and forests play a significant role in sustainable development, and not only in BC and, and other areas of Canada, but also uh, throughout the tropics. Next slide, please. So we um, essentially, uh, as I mentioned, uh, each week is a different SDG module. We explore the links between different SDGs with forests at the center and conservation at the center of those issues and try and identify opportunities, constraints, and also uh, to achieving the SDGs, but also looking at the synergies and trade-offs between individual SDGs. Um, focus on forests as part of sustainable development and, and why forests are important for future economic growth um, and achieving the balance between economic development and conservation. Of course, this is a conservation capstone course. Many of our students go into practicing conservation on the ground um, and they need, they really, the, the, the interest there is, is understanding how you can have conservation and economic development at the same time. Um, and we also identify additional SDGs, which is always interesting. And overwhelmingly, the st students um, advocate the free access of information as the, as the 18th SDG they like to see. Um, so transparency and open uh, access to information, getting rid of uh, polemic types of social media and making sure that um, what is online is evidence-based but available to everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just to touch on COP26, um, I was in Glasgow last year um, and there was a strong, strong focus on forests and deforestation issues. It hasn't really uh, uh, panned out according to the um, various announcements and declarations that were, that were made in November. Um, but it's interesting that this is the first COP that I've been to, certainly I mean, I've been to um, quite a few over the, over the years, where forests were really center stage on the sustainable development discussions. Um, and also the role of indigenous peoples in stewarding those, those, those forests and the, the remaining forests, particularly the tropics. And I think that's my last slide. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to share our work here. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Um, 
And I will just quickly share an approach that we are taking at the Sustainability Hub uh, in, within the, the leadership context. Um, and we use uh, the, um, the framework of competencies to integrate the SDGs framework. And this is more from the educational and curriculum aspect of things. Um, so the focus is, of course, um, uh, the SDG 4 um, in this, in terms of the, the lens that, that, that uh, we take in the leadership program. Um, there are key uh, competencies uh, that are that are uh, connected to the achievement of the SDGs, and instead of which is basically instead of focusing on the information or even on the skill acquisition, a more pragmatic yet uh, meaningful strategy is to focus on the attributes and competencies to acquire that that will be acquired by the learners in order to really uh, tackle the complexities that are within the SDGs. Uh, so competencies capture the sense not only to of acquiring but also producing knowledge and embracing different ways of knowing and avoiding the narrow focus on specific skills. So here are uh, 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 key competencies that were highlighted by UNESCO um, and uh, um, related directly to the SDGs. What we did within the, the Sustainability Leadership Program, which is a program for students at UBC who are interested in personal collaborative and community engaged learning, um, and they joined the program for a year from September to April. Um, and the, the, the focus we took was we took these competencies and we embedded them at the very high, highest level of the program. Um, so we integrated them within the learning objectives. So we took each competency and we turned them into the learning objectives for the program, as you can see here. And this is one of the one of the key ways uh, that UNESCO offers um, supports uh, for for programs and for courses to really integrate uh, them at the program and courses level. Um, the way uh, we um, integrate them uh, from the competencies level and learning objectives level um, into the implementation within the curriculum of the program is through these modules. Um, so the Know Yourself module, the Explore, uh, making connections uh, to your communities, uh, learning, revising, so that's where they learn a lot of skills in terms of project management and facilitation and working with teams, and then they, the implementation and practice and then uh, documenting and reflecting. Um, so we do a lot of work around this area, and if you're interested in this, I'm happy to talk more about this and share um, some documents here. Um, it's the competencies framework is also a, uh, a good framework for evaluation. So if you are wanting to embed that in your course level or even the program level, um, you can use this as an evaluation framework and ask questions as you are de um, developing your curriculum in terms of our learners able to work with interconnectedness or complexity in the systemic um, a context are the communication skills being taught or are learners be facilitated to work well with others so there are so this is this has been uh, proposed by uh, Naresh uh, um, Giran Gande and others and here's a uh, a link to that that article in terms of using it as an evaluation framework Shanta there's a quick um... A uh, question in the chat, maybe to go back two slides. I think just to show uh, the maybe at the end, but there was some interest in seeing the the slide two slides ago. Two slides ago. This, yeah, the no. learning objectives. Uh, Charlotte, maybe you can let us know which one you were hoping to see. Yes, thank you so much. That was the slide. I just I saw it quickly, and I was hoping to just get a chance to note down some of them. So that that's perfect. I've got it now. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And, and feel free to connect Charlotte and we can uh, chat more. Um, so from here, um, what, what students are doing, and so this, so this is the learning of um, a curriculum. And then as part of this program, um, students work with community partners to develop their own projects, their capstone project. And here are examples of some of the student projects that, uh, that we have done in the past through the program. SDG Week is a week-long conference um, that, that uh, students put together in terms of really engaging with the SDGs through different, um, different lenses. Uh, last year, uh, the students put together a uh, visualizing uh, uh, circular economies, so kind of visualizing the data that is available on campus, um, and they did a hackathon around that. Um, a, students, a group of students have put together this interactive map that you can see up here, and it's basically a, a sustainable consumption um, uh, stores and businesses that are available 
in the Vancouver area near UBC. Um, you can also see there is a climate and collective liberation project, and this was a project that was done through the climate justice lens and the and the connections between climate justice and social justice. And the, and, and this has been done through a storytelling lens. And uh, you, if you can, if you wish, wish to um, uh, visit the the web page, there is a there is a website now, um, and you can read these storytellings and and use them as case studies in your own courses. Um, so those are some of the some of the projects. Uh, there are many more. Um, in terms of how we integrate the curriculum within the, the leadership program, we use a lot of uh, transformative teaching approaches, um, and they, they are from prioritizing student choice and self-reflection to designing reflective practices using place-based or land-based learning opportunities and community connections specifically to do with the projects. Um, and uh, we integrate a lot of case studies and role plays, storytelling, um, um, uh, narratives to really integrate some of these learning um, pieces within within the program. Um, I wanted to just share this slide um, and I'm happy to share this with you. These are just some of the examples that other faculty um, members have used um, in terms of integrating the SDGs in their own coursework. Um, and it's it's really just gives you some ideas to adapt your own courses in different ways. Um, one of the ways that I have done is uh, I, I in within the teacher education program at UBC is through lesson lesson plans and case studies through developing case studies and lesson plans um, and giving the students the choice to choose the SDGs that they would like to work on and connect that to the learning objectives of the of the course. So um, maybe we'll stop there. Um, maybe we, we can open the open for Q and A before we move to Jamboards. Tara, what do you think? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Uh, we are maybe I'll put a link to the Jamboard in the chat so people can get it open. And we're we were yeah. hoping to get um, us having a little bit more of an interactive session here. So we'll put the link in the chat. Uh, but I definitely think this is a big framework. So some questions would be great. Any sort of um, basic understanding or and yeah, please let us know how we can help you. And I will also add that we will share a document that um, has all these links um, in the document. I'll share that with all the participants who registered for this workshop. Uh, hi, thank you for uh, the presentation. I have a question because uh, I am uh, a professor in computer science. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, I, I could introduce some of these topics in my courses. I just wonder if how they would be received since they are not really the, 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 the learning goals of my courses. So I was wondering if anybody has experience with introducing these topics in something that is like a bit further than, you know, forestry or, or other things so, and see how that went and how that was received. That's a great question. And I think one of the uh, ways that I would tackle that question is even putting it, asking the students themselves it, how they might see that this topic in this course might relate because I think uh, often, in my experience, students can see the connections almost faster sometimes than than those of us who might be more sort of stuck in the in the in the um, delivery of the education. Um, I would also add uh, that um, this link over here, and this is also included in the in the handout that we will um, send out. And this this document really helps in if you are really interested in connecting your existing learning objectives to the SDGs. Um, there's, a, there's a section in there that really helps faculty members um, really connect their existing course learning objectives to the SDGs. And there's a whole um, framework for that and um, steps. So that might be helpful. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for your presentations. Um, I just have 
um, a question. It might not be on the topic, but um, I was wondering if any of you have any uh, sort of insights on how we can adapt the SDGs or sustainability education to um, a, uh, to different age groups of learners, um, especially because a lot of these contexts uh, for your educational programming, like botanical garden or forestry, can um, you know be applied to different um, groups of people who might enjoy the benefits of this program. So all the way from Obviously, UBC students, a post grad, uh, post secondary education, um, to adult learning, to even um, early childhood education. So, what are your some of your sort of reflections, if you have any, on this um, generational gap that is kind of hidden a lot or ignored in planning for education um, as a whole? There's some links shared in the chat. I think Charlotte shared some some good links. Uh, I guess my my thought of Anytime we adapt, um, the SDG education is getting very clear on who we're adapting it for and and making sure that we understand what the needs of of the receiver are. And um, I know there's amazing work of teachers in grade three having all their kids so, sort of signing up to the SDGs. And so there's been real progress, I think, and lots of examples to see that it is a framework that can be translated to different audiences. Yeah, and I would add that um, I agree with Charlotte, Be the Change Earth Alliance has been doing a lot of work around um, SDGs lessons, lesson planning for educators in the K-12 setting. Um, there is another um, um, uh, session that's happening in July uh, specifically for K-12 uh, that might be more, more relevant in this case if you're interested in K-12. Uh, and there's, there's a different approach, of course, um, in terms of integrating K-12 versus secondary so do you do you have anything uh, it just occurs to me i have a nine-year-old son who's, who's at um, school here in vancouver and um, they've just started doing issues related to sustainable development use the sdgs as a convening framework and it does provide a really neat way for people to think about issues of poverty hunger and um, better land stewardship etc um, and, and i think the sdgs provide probably better than the ND, millennium development goals a much more relatable framework and I think society as a whole what we've gone through the last three years society is starting to think about these issues so much more and are so much more receptive to to you know learning more about some of these um, the, these particular issues and, and not just in the context of forestry but in in the context of their own lives and their own existence and I, and I think that there's the world has become an increasingly receptive to and educated about everything that's affecting them and I think the last three years has really highlighted um, issues of environment, poverty, <laughs> inequality etc um, and I think uh, the SDGs provide a, a flawed but very very good framework to start thinking about these things. Do we think move on to the Jamboard Tara? Yeah that sounds good maybe you want to share your screen and we can look at the Jamboard um, and I believe that, Julia, you're still here. I had one thought on your computer science course. And one of the things that when you look at the SDGs and what we've, even at, here at the Botanical Garden, pulling together all our information, information management is really challenging and understanding all of the interactions. Um, so I definitely see computer science as a, as a field to help with information management of tracking the SDGs and showcasing the interlinkages between them. Um, so to the Jamboard now, are you okay, Shamta, to share your screen on that one? Yeah. We wanted to, we have a, a few questions we were hoping to engage and get your input on and to get a sense. I know some of you already shared in the chat, but um, I think just as a quick uh, rundown uh, in terms of a Jamboard. You can add in a post-it note on the left there. And we were just hoping to go through these questions to get a better sense of how people are using SDGs, if they are using them, and as well as perhaps some of the barriers that you're facing in using them, and then trying to see what type of resources and support would be of use to people doing um, so um, maybe we can do it in the uh, starting in the chat. And I, I know that we had people already share uh, some of the courses that they're involved in teaching. So page one of the Jamboard was getting a sense of what are people teaching. Um, 
We have engineering design. Look at this. We've got psychology. Welcome, uh, Karen. I think uh, we're working in a Jamboard. Uh, we have just presented on the SDGs. I'll put the Jamboard in the chat so you can join us. Uh, there we go. Astrobiology. That's great. I think, does the at person who teaches astrobiology, were they the one who also was talking about space? <laughs> Great. So I see there's a, d a diversity of courses being taught here. Um, and and that's really great. Uh, teaching in higher education. I don't know what the PGCHE is. Um, maybe, maybe whoever wrote that might be able to let us know what that acronym means. But there's youth workshops. Uh, with the climate hub and the be the change, which is great. We have accounting, libraries, knowledge synthesis. That's great. So what we'll do if you haven't put your teaching areas post grad certificate in higher ed? Thank you, Danielle. Appreciate that. Uh, that's in the chat, Shamta. So maybe we can add that afterwards, just so we have it. Um, great. Thank you for contributing. We'll go to the next one which is, is this is kind of a, a yes, no. So if, if you have been dabbling a little bit in, uh, in integrating the SDGs into your teaching or into your research, um, on the left, you can, you can please share with us how, how you have been doing that. Um, and if not, if this is a, a totally new topic and you're here today, to figure and, and consider it, uh, which SDGs are you sort of seeing the closest links to? So seeing connections to goal 10, reduced inequalities. And if anybody, maybe we, I know that there uh, be the change, you, you would sort of fall into the left-hand side. And I agree that the, the, in terms of data analytics, definitely a connection to them all. Um, and like Terry is using them as case studies, you know, trying to uh, explore case studies of them as individuals and also them in, in their network and how they work together. Oh, that's a neat idea. Linking libraries to the SDGs and providing links for people working in these sectors. Very, very interesting. I Again, I, I think information management is one of the challenges we face for sustainability and turning information management into information access. So having the libraries, uh, very, very important. Uh, life underwater, life on land. Oh, interesting. We have um, integration of the SDGs into community psychology. Uh, really, really, uh, I'd be fascinated to sort of know more about wh what that, how you do that. Uh, but it also looks like it might be difficult to integrate them into more traditional courses in psychology, uh, which are focused on individuals. Oh, very interesting. People are incorporating them in workshops. Uh, which is great. And I think workshops and sort of as micro places for people to learn about the SDGs is a, a, a key piece. And there's a few people looking to, at and seeing climate action is, is relevant to teaching. Uh, and I would say there's a direct link between climate action and psychology. Um, one of the barriers we have struggled with is in, in terms of trying to mobilize climate action is understanding human behavior, behavior and some of the, the barriers to, to action. So um, that's great. And there's an example of civic engagement in classes and workshops. So connecting to goal 16. Um, I don't see anything else popping up. Maybe we can fast forward to the next one. And this is, this is a, um, an important one. What prevents you? What, do, what are some of the barriers and the challenges that prevent you from integrating SDGs into your teaching? I, I feel like we heard uh, a few in the questions around, you know, trying to see the links and understand the links. Uh, as well as um, one of the barriers might be how do you adapt the SDGs to different audiences that you might face. If anyone else would be open to sharing some of what they see as their 
their barriers that prevent them or they think that might make it difficult for them to integrate uh, the SDGs into their teaching, please, please share with us. I know one of the barriers that we have faced in trying to develop programming for businesses is, is really understanding our audience's needs um, in realizing that perhaps what we think of their needs isn't what they would say is their needs. So sometimes a bit of a mismatch between uh, what we think our audience is, is um, thinking and versus what they are thinking. Uh, there's a comment here about students not responding to them well. Uh, oh, interesting, and that perhaps the SDGs might be slightly going off topic. Terry, do you want to speak to that a bit? Do you have thoughts on that? No, it just goes back to my earlier point that I think we'd be surprised how much interest there would be, um, even though it's off topic. It's These are issues that affect all of us. Um, I don't know. Um, I've been involved in quite a few um, student activist uh, um, events here in, uh, in at UBC as well and and feel of course that's a, that's a receptive audience but feel there's a lot of interest in these issues um, across the, the university um, not just in forestry or environmental sciences um, so I think maybe we shouldn't underestimate how much students would engage perhaps in these issues. I agree I think students in my view have been the ones calling for more action in this area, uh, as well as I think uh, because of it, to me it links to the climate anxiety that we hear students facing, um, that, and that seems to be across disciplines. Oh great, yes, some of these things are incredibly difficult to measure, so it's hard to measure inequalities. Um, the, the evaluation and, and, and for us at the garden, we've just been going through this trying to evaluate our actions. This is a very complex. How do we localize the targets and the indicators is a huge, huge challenge. Um, oh, interesting. I like this that how do we integrate it into a process engineering design that is already quite dense packed. Um, and students have a high workload and learn quickly what gets top. And, and, and to me, this is, you know, you're in engineering design, I presume, actually, you're working in complex processes and systems. Um, really, really interesting to, to see some of this feedback uh, and seeing there that there's psychology's focus on individual psychology rather than collective psychology. Um, uh, yeah, again, they're, they're actually there's a great resource I can share uh, on psychology and they looked at its um, behavior change for conservation uh, done by an organization called RARE and they create uh, and provide guidelines for how can we develop conservation programs that speak to these complexities of human behaviors from individuals to collective behaviors. A top priority I see there is to reprioritize or give the SDGs some equal billing. Uh, again, yes, we'll, we often see if, if you're dabbling in the SDGs, some are much more prominent than others. Um, and I think that is a, a key challenge. We, we see a barrier in library teaching is one-off sessions and rather than sustained through a cohorted program. And I think, you know, Shamta's program for the sustainability ambassadors sort of shows a, a bit of a cohort and the value of groups coming together to explore these. Great, and I think there's there's a number of, um, a number of great points here. Uh, and thank you for, for sharing that. Um, Please feel free if you think about any more as we go to add them in. Danielle sharing an Irish an Irish SDG toolkit, which is great. There's there's a number of really uh, interesting teaching toolkits, and Shamta put together a great list of resources that we'll share out afterwards that um, that can hopefully help you along your way, depending on which discipline you're working with or which groups you're trying to engage. Um, maybe we can move on to 
the last one and I in relation of what support and resources or tools there's I, I sometimes find it I, I overwhelming actually there's a bit of analysis paralysis because there if, if you start to look into all the diversity of tools there's a lot out there um, so I think uh, what Shamt has pulled together are some sort of curated resources perhaps but if there's other things that would be helpful um, please let us know is it is it uh, uh, what type of resources you might be looking for or how, how what are some practical things that that would help you integrate the SDGs into your teaching and if you know of any great resources please yeah feel free to share them that would be that would be great I know there's some courses um, and I, I definitely think there's some instructors who are working together. I think uh, working uh, and uh, within your faculty or within your department uh, and sharing best practices and case studies is really important. I know I've learned a lot from other botanical garden educators when they share what did not work. <laughs> and I think it's very important at times to realize and to share those examples of when, oh, that framing didn't necessarily work or an activity didn't necessarily work. So perhaps finding some colleagues that you might be able to brainstorm with and, and share back might be a way of um, helping to build a bit of momentum and, and have you somebody to help you along the way. This is the, I think, Shamta, maybe we did the first one of these sessions in 2019, I believe. Um, and actually that's where we met Terry and so um, we we were sort of you know I know there's other people I think Cyprian was here he's left there's other staff and definitely other champions for this topic here at UBC uh, and um, so there is a I would say a growing network around this um, if you can think of other resources that would be helpful please feel free to share them and uh, Shamta, back to you. I think this. I think that brings us to the end of our wiki, not wiki, our um, Gamboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, no, that was that was great. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, uh, this is this is going to be very useful for us uh, as a sustainability hub in terms of what how we can help support some of the faculty um, on campus. Um, I just wanted to quickly show you uh, what we will share. What's coming your way. Uh, via email. Um, so this is this is the document that we've been talking about. Um, we will share this with you. It's kind of uh, categorized under tools, lessons, teaching resources, um, university ranking, general information. Uh, there are some uh, key books that I find um, helpful and interesting. Um, there are some articles um, and reports, some of the, so the new ones that came out recently, and also some of the um, uh, other uh, key ones here, um, as well as some of the MOOCs and, and networks that, that you can find some uh, uh, support from. So we will share this um, through email uh, with all the registrants for this, for this session, so you'll have that. Plus, uh, feel free to, to get in touch if you want to uh, connect with any one of us. We'll be here for another few minutes if you have any questions, uh, but thank you so much for joining us and for participating.